very warm welcome to this King's Fund online event where we're going to be exploring what's in store for health and care in 2021 and beyond. I'm Anna Charles, Senior Advisor to the Chief Executive here at the King's Fund and I'm going to be chairing this event. We'll start shortly by hearing from our Chief Executive Richard Murray who will share some thoughts to set the scene for us uh, and um, uh, and um, start the conversation off and I'll then be joined for the discussion by three of my expert colleagues from the King's Fund who are here to share their reflections on what to expect from the year ahead and to answer all of your questions. Our panellists will be doing their best to gaze into their crystal balls and predict what's on the horizon but as 2020 shows events can sometimes take us in quite a different direction to the one that we expected. Now this is our first online event of the year but it's been a busy year already for health and care as the system has been responding to the extraordinary pressures resulting from the latest surge in COVID-19 infections and as it's begun to roll out the biggest vaccination campaign in its history. So we could easily spend an hour talking about the operational response to COVID-19 over the next few months, but there are a whole range of other important issues on the horizon too with consequences for health and wellbeing and with consequences for people working in health and care. So as far as possible, we're going to try and look in the round at a range of issues during this event. We'll use most of the time that we've got to answer questions from you, our online audience. So you can send those questions in to us throughout the conversation and please do send them in early uh, and send them in frequently. I can see some coming through already. You should be able to see a box on your screen where you can type in your questions and I'll then be able to see them as they come through and I'll put them to our panel. Now we have got over 4,000 people registered to join us for the event today with a huge range of backgrounds and I expect different interests so we'll probably get lots of questions so that means if you can please keep them as short and clear as possible we've got the best chance of getting through uh, as many as we can. You can also follow and contribute to the discussion on Twitter using the hashtag KFOnline. And finally, you should be able to see some links on the page to resources and reading that we think you might find helpful after the event is finished. So please take a look at those too. So I think that's everything I need to cover to get us started. Let me now introduce Richard Murray, Chief Executive of the King's Fund, who's going to give his thoughts on the big issues on the horizon for 2021. So I'm going to talk uh, fairly briefly um, both about the recovery from COVID. So right now I know it's hard to look beyond the COVID context with the NHS and all of its partners dealing with a challenge the like of which we've never seen, certainly within NHS history. It involves dealing with patients as they begin to get ill, then a wave coming from that of people being admitted to hospital, then unfortunately another wave coming as people need critical care and then very sadly the final tragedy is so many indeed then go on to lose their lives. But of course, outside of hospitals, it's a huge issue in social care as people try and protect the vulnerable, not only in care homes, but often in their own homes. And of course, the struggle to continue running as many other health and care services as is possible to do so for all the people that don't have COVID, but that have other conditions. And now, of course, many people are engaged in the biggest vaccination drive in NHS history. As hard as it is to look beyond the current context, there are signs across the country that we are beginning to move past the peak. And as we do so, of course, it remains incredibly important to keep aware of COVID, uh, both us in the United Kingdom and in other countries, we've seen how quickly COVID can return once people begin to let their guard down. This time, that won't happen. I'm not going to try and do a review of the United Kingdom's response to COVID. That's not what this is about. What happens though, once we do come begin to come out of COVID, what will the world begin to look like? Well, first off, there's clear a whole series of changes to people's health need. There'll be many people suffering from long COVID, many people needing rehabilitation from prolonged periods of intubation in critical care. But of course, many other people we know have stayed away from the health service during this time. They've avoided A&E, even sometimes when having heart disease and stroke. But of course, also interruptions to the care provided for people with long-term conditions. There will have been new people who will have developed a long-term condition that we won't yet have identified in the community. Huge changes to mental health services as much of care has moved online or onto the telephone 
and of course a change in mental health need with many people isolated for long periods of time and many of their normal support systems having ended. And in social care too, we also know many people have not come forward for care or not wanted it when it's been available and that too will have had an impact on their health and well-being. Much of the attention of course is on the backlog, the waiting list which has grown enormously in uh, the acute sector and of course that's a great worry threatening to push us back uh, decades to when long waits were a big issue for uh, England. But we do need to remember and take a system view. Mental health services have changed, mental health need has changed, things have changed in primary care, people's care has been interrupted. These don't get counted so much but they're just as important. As we think about recovery we need to make sure we're building up on the health needs across the widest proportion of the population so we can try and prioritise what needs to be done. And of course Covid didn't create health inequalities in this country, they pre-existed and have always been there but it did shine a really brutal light on the extent of inequalities in England and in other countries too and as we come out although those inequalities aren't new, there's certainly a renewed emphasis on trying to make more progress on reducing inequalities. Outside of health and care, the context has changed too, and that will be increasingly important as we think about how to support local communities. The economy is in the deepest recession in its history. Public finances, particularly in local government, are very stretched. And some colleagues in the voluntary sector are facing real funding problems as many traditional funding routes have dried up. And as this happens, unfortunately, we know from the past, and is it happening again now, that often those economic downturns hit the most vulnerable, hardest of all, and indeed that is happening once again. So the context outside of the health service has really moved very dramatically. Does that mean that we take our hand off of COVID and hit the big red button on recovery? No. Um, one of the most important and severe impacts of COVID has been on staff working in health and care, and of course the volunteers that also have come forward to help in this time of need. Many staff are exhausted, many will be suffering from anxiety, some cases of PTSD. Uh, we need to place the, the welfare of staff and the workforce challenge right at the very heart of all we do on recovery or it simply won't work. That includes providing additional support to people who've been through some very difficult times but also again returning to the goal to try and increase some of the numbers in health and social care so we can begin to bring down at a greater pace some of those workload pressures that lay so heavily on top of our staff. <clears throat> that means that we can't pretend we're going to move back to 2019 quickly and it's going to need some patience as we nurture our staff and help them to come back and then provide the care that the population needs. Now this may sound all terribly gloomy uh, but there are some real points of optimism as we think about recovery. It's easy to point, I think, uh, most noticeably to the changes in the use of technology. We do talk a lot about switching services online. Of course, in fact, the telephone, a rather more traditional piece of technology, probably took more weight. But even having said that, the shift was enormous. I think nobody would have believed from 2019 that health and care services could have moved so dramatically at such pace. Some of that was done as an emergency measure, and we'll need to unravel it. In many cases, this can represent a huge opportunity to provide care in a different way, in a more sensitive way. And we will need to keep aware of those that don't have such good digital access. Uh, but with that in mind, there's real opportunities around technology and a real understanding that the system can move at pace when it needs to. We've also seen a great increase in cooperation across the NHS. So rather than the old model of competition that we've been running in this country for decades, <clears throat> cooperation and collaboration was key to the NHS's response. Mutual aid between different organisations with staff, PPE, with testing and indeed now often with vaccination as well. So instead of each hospital trying to stand on its own to resist those Covid waves, there was a real drive across the system to make sure that everybody worked together and that's been absolutely key and something we'll of course want to keep. But beyond the NHS, um, uh, that's also been true in some other sectors too, not everywhere and certainly not everywhere across the country. So if we think about social care, clearly some weaknesses in, uh, enormous weaknesses in the response to COVID from the government on social care and that protective ring around social care rather late in coming, even if it's there now. Uh, but in many local areas then, 
NHS, local government, social care partners working together to try and protect the most vulnerable. And often we've also seen in many parts of the country the voluntary sector being able to step up to an enormous degree to support other services and to support people both at home, in hospital, and now, of course, on the vaccination programme. And that's been an issue for many decades of trying to bring the huge strengths and opportunities of the voluntary sector closer to those in the statutory sector of the NHS and indeed local government as well. Now, we could lose some of these gains. Older behaviours could come back, uh, begin to begin to work more again in silos. But this is under a lot of this under our own control and a real goal to try and keep this better system working and the better use of technology as we look towards the future and making that at the heart of our um, program on recovery. That's a lot of reform already, not reform passed by um, the House of Commons and the House of Lords, but reform nonetheless. But we are likely to see almost certainly a renewed effort from the government on reform in health and social care. And I'd just like to say a few words on that too. So just before Christmas, NHS England uh, and Improvement published their document on integrating care setting out how they see the future of the system working. So building up from a place level approach, places are often on local government footprint. Uh, there can be other footprints where there's a meaningful local community. And this is where a lot of the integration happens, multi-system working together between the NHS, local government, the voluntary sector, and indeed, of course, the private sector too. Then on slightly bigger geographies, those places combine together to form the integrated care systems, ICSs. And that document set out proposals to put these on a statutory footing, so legislation, primary legislation, to create these as statutory bodies. And alongside these, new provider collaboratives, sometimes working on an ICS footprint, particularly uh, for single sectors, so acute hospitals with acute hospitals, mental health with mental health, uh, but also importantly at place where the acute sector, mental health, general practice, social care come together to think about integration. So a major agenda on trying to build in and, and maintain some of those gains we saw through COVID. And of course, the possibility that with all of this change, the Department of Health and Social Care will redraw the boundaries of independence with NHS England and NHS Improvement, probably one of the positives of the 2012 Act, and we'll be watching that carefully. We expect this to move at pace, so probably legislation in 2021, early in the year, and possibly enacted in 2022. So a real attempt to drive this through at great pace. We've also got to work out what to do with public health. So if there were weaknesses, and there were certainly some weaknesses in the United Kingdom's response, given the enormous toll on mortality we've seen, some of them came around the public health response, around the timing of lockdown, the strength of lockdown, lockdown and the duration with it. Now, an early victim of that was Public Health England, long, I should add, before it was clear it was anything to do with Public Health England, but Public Health England and its abolition was announced last year, and we haven't yet seen the proposals from the government about how that public health system will work, whether it's at national level, regional level, how it will work alongside and within ICSs and within places. But of course, that is critically important if we're trying to deal with inequalities, we're trying to think about how we protect against the next pandemic, and of course, how we deal with long-standing issues of public health around obesity and others. Uh, alongside, it is important, as I say, alongside the discussion about how those structures work, we really need to see a change in the approach on public health. And I think COVID has shown some of the weaknesses over the previous decades in the United Kingdom and certainly within England. So it doesn't make much difference what the structures are if public health isn't funded appropriately and if public health doesn't get the chance to think about other levers like regulation, like taxation, so critical in the battle against tobacco and then how those might be able to be used on other public health challenges. And then lastly, and I'm sorry to come lastly once again to social care, um, uh, on the positive side, I don't think the public have ever been more aware of social care, of the importance of social care, and of the challenges facing the staff and the people that use it. But there's been a long standing failure in this country to place the funding of social care onto a secure footing, and this certainly contributed to some of the difficulties we saw through COVID, but of course, were problems before COVID and will be problems again. We have a greater awareness amongst the public, as I said. We have a government that said it will fix social care. We have a government with the majority. So what we do hope is that this year, the government will keep to its promises to bring forward 
proposals on social care to place it on that longer term, more secure footing that will mean people will get access to the care that they need and indeed should ever another pandemic come that we won't be exposed as we were this time around. So a lot of change in the service at the moment, a lot of change in the service over the year and some major pieces of change and reform coming from the government. Uh, I hope that was helpful and I hope you find the rest of this morning both interesting and useful. Good morning. Thank you, Richard. There's lots to reflect on there, and I think we certainly aren't going to struggle to fill the next hour reflecting on all of that. So I'm now going to bring in our panel of King's Fund experts to lead us through the rest of the discussion. So first, can I ask each of you just to introduce yourselves very briefly uh, to our audience, say a little bit about who you are and what you do here at the fund. Uh, Susie, let's start with you. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Susie Bailey. I'm the Director of Leadership and Organisational Development here at the King's Fund. Great, thanks Susie. Uh, good morning everybody, great to be with you. I'm Sally Warren, the Director of Policy here at the Fund. Hi Anna, morning everyone. My name's Sivan Andesiva, I'm the Chief Analyst here at the Fund, working in the policy team, mainly on funding, finance and productivity. Great, well, thank you all and looking forward to the next 45 minutes or so. Um, so I wonder if we could start with some broad reflections really on what you heard from Richard, because he's highlighted lots of challenges and potential change on the horizon. So for each of you standing back from that, which of those issues really stand out for you? Or is there anything else that you'd add? Siva, perhaps I can come to you first on, on that one. Thanks, Anna. So no, uh... As I was listening to Richard, no one particular issue stood out, but two more thematic things stood out. The first was Richard talked to God about the need for patients, that addressing some of the backlogs of care that are built up will take quite a lot of time. And he also talked about the need to focus on some of the hidden weights for care that are building up that aren't immediately obvious from the national data. And I think that's absolutely right. But at the same time, I wouldn't have said that patients and a focus on the less obvious aspects of care have been the defining features of healthcare policy over the last 10 years. So the first thing is I'm a little bit worried that there's a growing disconnect between where a lot of the national policy focus will be and where some of the need is. Well, I suppose the second thing was, as Richard kept talking, I thought all of this is really relevant, but there's a lot going on. And it made me think of some of the emails I've been getting from strategy leads in trusts who are coming back to work. And it's almost following a template where they say, hi, I'm just back into my strategy role after quite a long time spent supporting frontline services in a more operational role. There's a lot going on. We still have to keep some of our Brexit prep going. Uh, we have provided collaboratives now. Uh, all my colleagues in the CCGs have moved on. So there's an awful lot happening. So I think in this sort of environment where there's an awful lot happening, the need for good leadership, good governance, and focusing on the things that remain in your span of control will become ever more important. So I think the, uh, the disconnect between health policy at the national level and local level, and the need to focus on what's in your control amongst the maelstrom of policy issues was what stood out for me from Richard. Great, thanks Siva. I'll, um, I'll kind of build from that. So I think my main reflection, and it, it, it starts from the, the sheer size of the agenda, is that actually uh, we're going to have to have a really honest conversation between politicians, national leaders of the NHS, the workforce in the health and care system and the public about what can reasonably be expected over the next few years in terms of the pace of recovery uh, and therefore the pace of improvement in services, what the right balance is between recovering the backlog versus investing in new services and more on prevention and early intervention. And I think unless we have that honest conversation with ourselves about how many years might it take for us to get back to waiting lists that we were having five or 10 years ago, I think the risk is it's particularly the staff in the health and care system who will feel like they're having to manage an impossible situation where the demands on them, the expectations from the public and from national leaders is just too high so I think to be fair to our staff who have done so much over the last year that honesty is really important. Thanks Sally I mean, I'd like to build on that really I think the the overriding thing that I heard from Richard is really about the importance of staff well-being uh, it's fortunately come much higher up the agenda I would say in the last year as people have been dealing with the pandemic and what we need to ensure is that what follows 
continues to keep well-being uh, right at the core of, of all of our planning, all of the, the uh, kind of what's within your control. Fundamentally, health and care services rely on the incredible talents and intrinsic motivation of thousands and thousands of staff. And unless we look after them, give them time to rest and recover uh, in order to deal with uh, what follows, um, we're going to we're going to have a problem. Um, before the pandemic, uh, workforce was the biggest issue that hasn't gone away. So um, I think keeping health and well-being at the core of any planning is going to be critical. Thanks all for those reflections. I've just been looking at the the questions that are coming through already um, from our audience, um, and it, some of them pick up Sally on the point that you made about the sort of balance between uh, a need for honesty about what what's possible in terms of recovering the backlog, uh, recovering services versus investment in improving services and shifting to prevention. We've got loads of questions on. Um, more preventive models supporting people to support their own health and well-being. So what would you say in terms of um, where that focus on sort of population health and well-being can sit when we've got all these really immediate pressures on waiting lists for operations which are perhaps much more visible, perhaps more uh, immediate in people's minds? Where will the balance for that be? Yeah. Uh Nice to see you started off with a nice, easy question there, Anna. Thank you. Um, so it's a really important question. I think uh, one of the first thing I say is we don't yet know what the backlog is or what the impact of COVID has been on, on health and care systems. So right now we can see some of that in some of the waiting times data, but there'll be an awful lot of unmet need that is hidden in the figures, but also of changed healthcare need because of new things like long COVID that we don't really know how that's gonna pan out. So we don't yet know what that means. But if I kind of step back from that specific to think about, we've got an opportunity with population health management and before COVID um, really knocked the health and care system uh, kind of uh, flat last year, there was increasing recognition across a whole range of health, local government and care leaders that population health management was really important about if you want to fundamentally change the health of the nation and therefore the demand for health and care services, it's about getting up, upstream, investing early. And what we saw some, was some really encouraging signs about the first emerging integrated care systems, really thinking about that on a place level, really thinking about how they can connect to the economy, to their place, to a whole set of things that are around wider determinants. So I feel that it's really encouraging. The risk, though, is that a kind of a spending review scenario, public services being really tight, that the focus ends up being on the things which are easier to count, like hospital activity, and quicker to deliver results. So I think what's really important is that as, um, as national leaders are engaging in debates about the spending review, engaging in debates about reform, that they don't allow the spotlight to turn away from um, that wider question around population health management, because that is the thing that will really change stuff. I think if if COVID has taught us anything, it's that health and the economy are intrinsically linked. They are uh, two sides of the same coin. And that's probably a realisation that a few of us have always had, but it's becoming a much more wide, uh, uh, more, much more widely understood. So I think that's a, a positive we should kind of really embrace and build from. And, and that picks up, Sally, our um, most popular question at the moment on from Beth Hill on what's in store for system working. And she mentions ICSs, integrated care systems, ICPs, integrated care partnerships, which are at the more local place level, and PCNs, primary care networks. So lots of the current acronyms uh, in that question. And I'm delighted it's our most popular because uh, that's the area I do lots of work on. So I'll just share a few uh, reflections on what we see as sort of top things uh, on the agenda for the development of those those partnership structures over the year ahead and beyond. Um, so I think it's pretty clear, as Sally said, that there's great potential uh, in greater collaboration and system working across different parts of the health and care system. And actually, we've seen, not everywhere, but in many parts of the country, really great examples of that different way of working, uh, collaborative way of working, really coming to the fore in the response to COVID. So there's a lot of energy and enthusiasm, I think, within the system for people to capitalise on that, build on that, uh, and particularly, I think, as you said, Sally, um, to really think about how that expands beyond just joining up different bits of services, but into reaching into communities, improving population health. There are some quite sort of big structural things potentially on the horizon with implications for ICSs uh, and the partnerships within them. So ICSs have been developing for a number of years now, but 
pretty informally and gradually. There had been um, an ambition from the long term plan uh, back in 2019 that the whole of the country would be covered by an ICS by April 2021. We're rapidly approaching that and the uh, ambition of the national bodies is that that will still be the case. Uh, and there are now some quite clear proposals to put ICSs onto a statutory footing through changes to legislation. Now there's lots of detail still to be worked through uh, for those proposals, lots of questions that they raise about what a statutory ICS will look like, what it will mean. Some things are clear, there's going to be some quite big changes I think to how commissioning organisations run, that will mean some quite big changes potentially for staff in those organisations, but lots of the detail is still to be worked through uh, and we've got some materials on that uh, on our website if people are are interested but one stand back thing I would say on that is as important as the structural stuff in the legislation is it will only take you so far so really in terms of what's in store for system working Beth's question I think the real challenges are in how local leaders work together to build relationships build different ways of working build connections locally at that system level or at those more local levels of place-based partnerships and and primary care networks so lots of um progress to build on from COVID, but of course barriers will re-emerge around funding and different ways of working, so it's all still to play for, uh, I think. Siva. Thanks, Anna. Uh, sorry, the coffee has taken some time to kick in, so I was just going to come in on the end of what Sally said, but then also what you said. So on, on what Sally said, I, I completely agree. Um, and, you know, to a certain extent, this is what the system does anyway. You deal with the problem that's in front of you, whether it's a growing waiting list or the urgent pressures over winter. And at the same time, you've got your five year plan for what you want the health and well-being of your population to be in the long term. I guess my only nervousness about population health management and well-being and that approach is, is that what's really going to be prized by the absolute top of the office? And if you've got an election in three years time, I think there is a real risk that you will focus on the things that are easy to see, easy to measure, like reducing a waiting list for care, rather than things that take longer, but ultimately are going to benefit the health and well-being of the population. And just two examples. One, what what is the public health budget for next year? Uh, what is it for the year after that? I couldn't tell you, but I can tell you what the NHS operational budget will be. And also going back to that, what I was saying in the intro, a lot of the people who would be doing this long-term planning had been continually sucked into operational roles, and it's understandable. But if we keep doing that for the next year or two, it just shows the opportunity cost of who's going to be doing the planning for the long term. And then on on what you see, every time you talk about systems, I learn something new. Um, and on what it means for system working, I think it's all it's first of all, it's getting real. So a lot of the things that were started as planning forums, as places to convene, bring people together on a voluntary basis, are now going to become responsible for delivery. And this phrase, delivery vehicles, is becoming attached to ICSs. And I think that really does change the dynamic of some of these relationships where you're accountable for delivery as well as planning for how services are going to transform. And the other thing, reading the, you know, I was rereading the paper from the NHS EI board meeting that really sets out what these legislative proposals are going to put forward. And it is incredibly complex how these relationships will work. I think the when you say system working, the image that forms in your head sometimes is of one big round table and all the system partners around. Well, it's actually more like three dimensional chess because you'll have some horizontal relationships say amongst mental health providers or hospitals, but there'll also be vertical relationships with uh, those providers and providers of primary care, community services, there's the voluntary sector, there's the independent sector. So I think this, uh, the nature of system working is becoming more real, but also vastly more complex as a result of the proposals that are being put forward. Anna, if I can just add, I mean, I'm really pleased that you were talking about the relational aspects of this because it's very easy for us to get caught up in the sort of technical and the legislative. But fundamentally, this is about relationships between people at a local place level. And as Siva said, that, that those relationships need to encompass a vast number of players. So we've, you know, we often see things seen very much through a health lens. And, and this now needs to be very much done at a community lens in, involving patients and citizens as well. So, you know, time to develop those relationships is not something that is easily afforded. Um, and so, you know, what's important for system leadership is how to create the space 
in which those conversations and those relationships can develop and the trust can develop in order to tackle those complex issues. That's really interesting, Susie. And I think one of the things that we've um, been seeing and hearing when we've been working out with systems in the last sort of few months, really, is people reflecting on how much those relationships have developed through just having to get on and do stuff together through COVID. So a real sort of sense of building relationships through actually doing. I think Don Berwick has previously described it as acting your way to integration. And again, it just underlines, you know, you can do whatever you like in terms of drawing a neat structure and putting that into legislation. But um, uh, that's that's not going to take you to where you need. So continue. I think continuing all of that work together um, will be really critical. Um, we haven't yet really touched on social care, and it's one of our most popular questions uh, at the moment from Nicola about a long term settlement for social care uh, and what the prospects of that might be and what can be done uh, to make that happen, to increase the chances of that happening. Sally, this is absolutely one for you, I think, as one of our resident social care experts. Yeah, great. Uh, thanks, Anna. Uh, and thanks for the question, um, Nicola. Um, always like to see social care questions. So um, my answer to these kind of questions, normally uh, it changes depending on how optimistic or pessimistic I'm feeling that particular day, week or month. So um, I might just try and be a bit more sort of neutral uh, than just be driven by my um, my lockdown mood of the day. Um, so uh, obviously a long term uh, settlement for social care is absolutely needed. We've uh, we all understand what's been happening to social care over the last 10 years. Very, very tight funding settlements have meant um, increased level of unmet need uh, in people needing care and support. It's meant that um, providers have become increasingly fragile and a number are leaving the market, meaning in some areas there isn't enough care. Um, quality might not be as, as much as we would like it to be in a number of areas. So I think we all understand the range of issues. The workforce is um, paid at or near the minimum wage. There's really high vacancy levels and turnover. So we all understand the challenges. Um, and it works hand in glove with an NHS system which does have the certainty of a longer term funding system, whereas local government is has had an increasing number of yearly settlements. Um, so we absolutely do need a longer term settlement. And um, in terms of the prospect for that, um, if we step back briefly, uh, the Prime Minister, when he was first elected uh, back in July 2019, stood on the steps of Drowning Street and said, I'll fix social care and I've got a plan. Uh, 18 months later, we haven't seen that plan. Um, it's not clear to me that the Prime Minister understands the full range of problems facing social care. Too often that plan is posited as, as it's about the one, there is a problem about people having to sell their houses to pay for care and people feeling that's unfair and unreasonable, but that is only one lens of the problem. So what I'd be looking to from government um, is is a comprehensive plan that addresses the multiple issues across social care, which, yes, that's about the funding model. It's also about the quantum of funding. It's about how we support our workforce and develop meaningful careers in the sector. It's about how we make sure needs are met well and met in a really personalised way that allows people to live the life they want to live and connect to the communities they live in. So there's a huge potential here. The government's committed to a plan later this year. Um, I think all of us that have worked in and around social care, we have been here before, we've heard this before, uh, so there's absolutely no guarantee that, that plan will come. I think what that means for us is, um, as a sector, we need to be able to articulate what social care is for. I think too often it's seen uh, as an adjunct to the NHS or as a kind of uh, pressure valve to the NHS, so it's seen through that lens rather than the lens of people and communities living uh, living the lives they want to, uh, uh, being able to connect to communities, being able to uh, have a social network with their friends and families, being able to work. So I think it's about shifting the narrative to be clear what is social care and what's the benefit of it, both to individuals needing care and support, but also to the economy. This is a massive sector. We employ 1.5 million people in every single part of the country, and that will only grow that workforce as the population ages. So there's a huge economic potential here as well. So I think there's, there's something about how we describe the challenges and the opportunities in a way that um, makes it a broader issue and more linked to the wider government agendas around leveling up, recovering from COVID, uh, et cetera. So I think there's a, a real um, em, a requirement for us to keep banging the drum, but banging the drum about reform of social care in a using slightly different lenses and framing of the problem and the opportunity that might have happened uh, in the past. 
but I'll stop there, Anna. Otherwise, I could go on for the entire rest of the session, and that wouldn't be fair on others who also have specialist subjects. Well, to well, well, I was going to I was going to ask you a question, if that's right, Sally, which was. Uh, We've seen polling data for several years, which shows that two of the issues that have stymied reform could be that public awareness of what social care services are is pretty low. And um, when you ask about funding, people assume it's free anyway. And I was just wondering what your take was on how the pandemic might have changed that, because uh, the importance of social care was surely more front and centre and whether that's changed the politics of, of any of this reform. Yeah, so I think that's a really good question. So it has absolutely uh, increased the profile of social care. Um, but what I would say is it's increased the profile of parts of social care. So particularly care homes for older people have been uh, on front pages, rightly being very significant concerns about did the protective ring around them ever exist? Was it strong enough? Did it take too long? But actually, care homes for older people isn't the totality of social care. So there's a real risk that actually that uh, raised awareness kind of takes reform down a specific lens around institutions and older people, whereas actually social care is about a whole host of personal relationships. It's predominantly about supporting people in their own homes. Half of the spend is on working age adults rather than older people. So I think there's a slight risk that actually it, it reinforces, if you like, the wrong lens about how you look at the social care system. Um, Susie, I think you want to... Yeah, just so uh, Siva, just to build on Siva's question, I guess there's something around the key worker aspect this year. Do you think that um, much more attention on the key workers in social care has been helpful? Yes, I think so. I think we've definitely seen uh, in the last year, sort of social care was quite often a hidden service. People, you know, going in and out of people's homes. It, it's not something that's seen and visible to communities, whereas we've seen it be much more uh, front and centre. We've seen really encouraging recruitment figures over the last 12 months where people have been wanting to come and work in the sector. So I think one of the challenges for the sector then is to uh, to make sure it, it remains a sector that people want to stay and develop their careers in rather than come work for a short while and then maybe move into other roles when the economy starts to recover and bounce back. So I think there's a big opportunity. Uh, we have seen the sector be more um, attractive to people working as they've seen the benefit of of working in the sector and the importance of the work people there do. So I think there's potential there, but it's not guaranteed to see that um, that may be maintained uh, beyond this year. Thanks, Sally. Thanks, Susie. And Susie, just building on that, because you do a lot of work around workforce and supporting the workforce, both across health and social care. So is there, is there anything that you would um, sort of add to what has just been discussed about what's going to be needed for health and social care staff as we come out of this pandemic and is that going to be on offer for social care in the same way as it might be for staff from the NHS? Yeah so I think I mean as I was saying in the introduction I think fundamentally there is something around how we help staff to take rest and recover from what's happened this has been you know I'm going to use that that term that we've all used far too many times in the last year unprecedented but it has been unprecedented and I think the emphasis on what staff need in order to be safe and well at work um, is going to be really important. So helping employers, managers, supervisors um, really focus on the, the sort of the day-to-day -day basics is going to be really important um, because from some of the research we've done um, over the last year, it's evident that, that, that they're not always in place, some of the basic um, things to support staff. Um, a lot more emphasis on team working, I think. Um, we've seen some great examples of team working during the pandemic, but helping people to really understand what it takes to to, to be effective in a team in order to, to make sure that, that that support is there shift by shift, which is going to be really important. Um, but we can't get away from the fact that we simply don't have enough staff in health and care. So we've got massive vacancies in the social care sector and significant vacancies in health as well. And so actually how we address the workloads that the staff that are employed uh, are dealing with is also going to be important. So some basics, some basic management and supervision uh, improvements, but fundamentally, we're going to need to recruit more people. Yeah, thanks, Anna. I just wanted to come in quickly on the on the end because back back to that span of control. I was talking to some non execs who were saying, to be honest, we can't. Nothing we do will affect the macroeconomic environment or the immigration policy or many of the or the pay structures. All these things that normally affect the supply of labour in our market. But there are an awful lot of things that are in our control on the pastoral side of are we being the best employer we can be? And they said COVID had forced them to ask some really hard questions over 
some of the things that they'd ruled out from on-call sleeping arrangements to car parking, where they just said, we can't do it. They've had to really question themselves and say, actually, could we do it? And is this in our span of control? And the other thing, on, on the more positive side, I was speaking to a medical director uh, from you know, a mid-sized hospital, not a renowned teaching center. And he said, one of our biggest workforce problems was uh, our best staff would leave to work in the big procedures teaching hospital down the road. And he said, maybe one of the things we've learned from the pandemic is we our offer to you is to be one of the most flexible employers if you want to be uh, working in the healthcare system. You know, we can work around your, your life circumstances. If you want to live in another part of the country and do some of the work remotely, let's have a conversation about it rather than the conversation saying, this is how the work is delivered. How many shifts do you want? So I think hopefully there will be some positives that come out of this on staff wellbeing as well. Yeah, I agree with you, Sivir, and I think there's some fantastic examples up and down the country. Um, I think it really places the emphasis on staff engagement, staff being involved in those decisions and those ideas, um, because uh, I think there probably hasn't been enough emphasis on on kind of how staff can actually be involved in that co-design about what will really make the difference to them. And as you say, some of the, some of the things are, are small, then they don't require a lot of investment of money. Uh, they're just paying attention to the things that make a difference to people's daily experience of coming to work. And we've also had um, some questions through around new ways of delivering care, which will, of course, affect staff as well as people receiving care. So uh, one of our most popular questions at the moment is the expectation for the introduction of health technology that would support social prescribing and the public playing a more proactive role in their health and well-being. We've had another question from Steve on digital solutions for primary care and a, and a few others as well. Siva, I wonder if you um, have any reflections to share on digital change, how technology is going to change the way care is delivered, what's on the horizon there? Yeah, good good questions. Um, I suppose there are a few, look, looking ahead to 2021, there are a few things that we can already anticipate are unlikely to happen. One is, uh, you know, it may sound pretty boring and abstruse, but yet another leadership review of how technology is organized. I think there's one view, which is, why don't we just work with the structures we have? There's not going to be any perfect national leadership architecture, but I think a lot of oxygen will be spent working out what is the best way to have national leadership for technology development in the NHS. I think the second thing that will happen over the year is people will try and work out how do we hold on to some of the positive changes we've seen, particularly around uh, virtual consultations and outpatients in primary care. And in some places, uh, it's interesting, in some places they're seeing to expand it. So how can we move it into other specialties that we haven't been delivering virtually? In other places, are already having to fight a rearguard action against some of these digital changes receding. So speaking to one clinical director who said, uh, I have, I've got a group of consultants who still believe that their patients want to see them face to face and that this is a temporary set of arrangements uh, that will end once COVID ends. So I think we haven't, we can't just assume that a lot of the changes are here to stay. I think the third thing that will happen is we'll have to be a lot clearer to, when talking to the public about what is the offer. Is it that digital services are here to stay and they work alongside face to face appointments and it's your choice? Or is it that it's digital first unless you have a real need to come in? Uh, so where does control lie over who chose, chooses the mode of interaction? Uh, and just two more. Um, the, the penultimate one is I'm, I'm more optimistic uh, than I have been in a long time because we've spent a lot of time, particularly on the NHS side of the house, trying to work out what's the perfect geography to deliver digital strategy. Is it each organization comes up with its own strategy? or each region comes up with its own strategy, I think it's becoming clearer that an integrated care system seems to be a good natural geography for people to coordinate what their plans are over how people access services. So you won't have to have a very, very different experience if you live in North Central London, depending on what provider you use. And the final one, unfortunately, is a pessimistic one, where uh, if you were to ask me a year and a half ago what the biggest seismic threat to the NHS would have been, I wouldn't have picked a pandemic, a viral pandemic, I would have picked cyber attack after WannaCry. So I think 2021 will be partly about building resilience for the health and care system in the broader sense, not just against pandemics, but against things that can really lead to a seismic change in the availability of services. Sorry. Great. Thanks, Anna. 
Um, I thought given Siva uh, keeps adding to my answers, I, I'd re return the favour. Um, I just, I suppose the, the bit I wanted to pick up within in the question, um, the, there's been a number of comments and questions about the public playing a more active role or proactive role in their own health and well-being. Um, and I think obviously that is important, but I think we also need to recognise not everybody has the same opportunity to do that. So I think we really need to be thinking about um, sort of personal responsibility or individuals being proactive, uh, recognising the wider context and the wider environment in which people uh, are living their lives. So not everybody will have the same opportunity. That might be about digital exclusion, but also then when you go into wider issues about um, the determinants which actually drive our health uh, rather than treating us when we're sick. There's a whole range of issues where uh, we are we are, do not all benefit from the same opportunity. So I think it's really important that as we think about population health management, we think about um, all the different tools and levers we have, that there's a big focus both from a sort of national policy level, but also a local implementation level to kind of not um, to embrace and tackle those, uh, those inequities. So we're seeing a reduction in health inequalities, not an increase. Thanks, Sally. And we've had some recognition of that in the questions as well. So uh, a question about what would a marmot informed primary care network look like, given that 80 percent of health and well-being outcomes depend on social economic determinants? So I think that picks up the sorts of points you were talking about there. Uh, I'm also interested to return to Siva's point about um, sort of resilience in the system. And one thing that makes a system more resilient is the support that is on offer to people through communities and their families and unpaid carers and we've had a very popular question from Allegra Lynch uh, particularly about unpaid carers and the crucial role they play in the health and social care system uh, and how we ensure their needs and views are taken into account. Uh, so Sally just building on what you were talking about previously uh, what would you respond to Allegra's question there? Great thanks Anna and thanks Allegra a really good question. Um, I guess I, I would kind of think about it in terms of different levels or kind of different lenses so um, I think because I think too often we can focus on the, um, the big picture of national policy. But actually, if, if we start with carers, um, what's important for them is the support that's around them immediately locally. Uh, so what's their primary care network doing in terms of support for them? What's the place based work um, that can mean that there's a vibrant set of local community based services that can provide support and network and peer learning um, for carers? So some of that is about community-led and community-based peer learning. Some will be about formally provided support and training from primary care and, and social uh, social care, but it's a real mix there. You then kind of go up a level to more of the integrated care system level, where the question will be, how do you ensure the voice, the voice of carers, which it's not a single united voice, the need of a carer is, is different uh, right across the country uh, and within different places. So uh, it's how do you make sure the kind of the that the ICS plan reflects the needs of, of carers and in particular is building from what assets are there in the community already and therefore where might we need to build more. And then you finally get to the national policy position, which when we're thinking about carers, it's not just about the Department of Health and Social Care. It's about the Department of Work and Pensions. It might also be things like uh, housing policy. So there's a whole set of national policy spaces where we need to make sure the voice of carers is there. And that does require a really strong VCS sector who can um, help be the advocate and mediate the voice of carers because there's so many millions of them. Uh, you need help to be able to kind of funnel that into the way that government wants to do policy. So we have definitely seen over the last 12 months the absolute importance of a strong voluntary and community sector, both to support local communities, but also to make sure government is considering policies that actually work on the ground and reflect the realities of, of communities and uh, the pressures on unpaid carers. Thanks, Sally. And, and yes, we've had a question from uh, Neil Tester, who's sort of pointed out how the pandemic has opened the NHS's eyes to the power of working with charities and the opportunities there. I think we'd all all agree with that uh, re really, really strongly and something we're very interested in supporting and looking at uh, at the fund. One thing we haven't yet touched on that's um, come up in a few questions, including one from uh, Susie Roberts, is about the impact on mental health. Uh, as a result of the pandemic uh, and what's going to be done to uh, approach that to support people going forward. I'm not sure who best to come to uh, on this one. Sally, Siva, Sally, let's start with you. Another reflective one. 
great. Sorry, I, I, I pressed the wrong button there. So apologies for the slight delay. Um, a uh, really important question uh, around mental health. So if we um, if we kind of take a little look back, actually mental health uh, was uh, getting a different um, engagement in public debate and in public policy uh, before the pandemic struck, struck. So we had a mental health five year plan, uh, which was really the first serious attempt at addressing mental health need in a systematic way since the National Service Framework of the 2000s. So we, we were starting to see a stronger uh, kind of public policy healthcare response to mental health. I'm not going to pretend that was perfect. It certainly hadn't all been implemented, but the vision was a strong one um, uh, and was uh, was appropriate. We were also seeing in the wider public much greater debate and discussion and openness about mental health and the wide range of, of support that, that uh, communities can provide to themselves as well as they're needing more specialist support. So I think there were encouraging signs, but there are major challenges with mental health in terms of shortage of workforce, really long waiting lists, particularly for services uh, like children and mental health services. So there were major problems. We then have had the last 12 months. There is no way the last 12 months has, has had anything other than a detrimental effect on people's mental health. Uh, and that will translate into demand at, for primary care and specialist services uh, that the service is going to need to expand to meet. Uh, so I think that's really important. I was uh, actually going to potentially ask Siva to come in to talk particularly about children's mental health, because we've done some work at the fund about um, how other health and care services have recovered from emergencies and catastrophes uh, to think what we can learn for COVID. And one of the key things there is the absolute importance of children's well-being. So, so I, I wonder if it's it's worth kind of sharing a few snippets of that um, that those findings. Yeah, absolutely, Sally. So I guess on mental health, part of the issue is that the de demand is going to be so different to what the service is used to. So you're not getting an incremental increase in the need for demand due to demographic change or anything like that. What you've got is a shock to uh, demand in, in two ways, because you've got the direct and indirect impact of COVID. So you've got people who people talk a lot about the delay for a knee or hip operation. Imagine the constant anxiety of not knowing whether your operation, which can make a material difference to your life, is on or off again or on or off again. So you're living with that anxiety and uncertainty. You're living with the anxiety and uncertainty and loneliness of the lockdown. And then you've got a syndemic because alongside the viral pandemic, you've got an economic depression, increasing joblessness. So all of this is leading to what Sally was describing as an increase for the demand for mental health support across the board from very high acuity to uh, people who are having a reasonable, perfectly acceptable response to these awful circumstances of distress and anxiety. And one of the lessons when colleagues at the fund looked at previous disasters, whether it was earthquakes or other natural disasters like typhoons, uh, and you ask people the question of what's the one thing you wish you'd prioritize more and they said it was the mental health and supportive children because you don't you can't often see the stress that's happening within a family home children don't have access to the normal environment and the things that happen to your mental health there can have ramifications 10 to 15 years on so those places like canterbury after the after the christchurch earthquake where they put a huge amount of effort into understanding the needs of uh, children's mental health support in then thinking really creatively over where that support could be offered. So the health service working with schools to provide additional resources for counselling and support and collaborative uh, support networks, supporting families, uh, all of that paid dividends. But even they, when you ask them, said, we wish we prioritised the mental health support of children more because that 10 to 15 years on is still being scarred by, by the earthquake and it will be scarred by the pandemic unless we increase uh, support and resources now. I know, okay. I just, yeah, I was yeah, talking to a senior um, child mental health professional on Monday, and I don't think we can underestimate the um, the lack of capacity um, in the system at the moment. So I absolutely um, echo the points that Sally and Siva have made. But fundamentally, um, in terms of acute specialist services, there is massive under provision, um, and that is, you know, what's happened during COVID is. Has exacerbated that really so um you know one of the things that i think we're going to need to do is is tackle that capacity issue as well as do all of the other things which are more sort of a, a preventative kind yeah and sorry anna i just wanted to come back on you 
your question about resilience before, uh, it's really interesting that Sir Simon Stevens in his evidence is now talking about the buffer, uh, you need the buffer of capacity. And I think, you know, it's been mentioned before, but you can, it wasn't easy getting a CAMS, a child and adolescent mental health appointment before the pandemic. It wasn't that easy to get uh, an urgent operation or, or, you know, a short wait in an A&E department. So I think one of the lessons that should be learned from the pandemic is the price of resilience is spare capacity. It's spare staff, it's spare services, because uh, if you don't have those, even even in good times, it's hard to deliver the services that people need. And you've, it'll just mean you've got further and further to catch up when things go off plan, as they inevitably do. Yeah, thanks for that horrible way to learn that lesson, but it's been illustrated so starkly, hasn't it? Um, and I'll also highlight the, the work you were talking about on learning from disasters elsewhere. I think, am I right, that's being published in the next few weeks on our website, so people will be able to read more about that if they're interested. Yeah, lots of nods, good. Um, a more stand-back question then uh, from Sebastian, uh, which I think is a really interesting one. He said, in all the focus of trying to catch up, how do we preserve our learning uh, from this and being better prepared? So we've started to touch on that, but there may be kind of broader learning as well uh, from the experience of the last year. Susie, come to you on that. Yeah, so I think, um fundamentally i think that is about how you build local learning systems so how you embed that into the daily work of teams and organizations and i think we've seen some great examples of organizations particularly those perhaps that have uh, embedded quality improvement approaches um who've really thought about how to capture that learning and i know that nhs england nhs improvement have got a beneficial changes program where they've been receiving lots of data from organizations on the health side about things that have worked really worked in in covid and, and why that was the case um there's also been uh, some publications including the learning from the nightingale in at the excel center in london about how they captured the learning on on, on the shifts as they and they embedded that into their ways of working um, Certainly, if you go back to Don Berwick's review um, post mid staffs, he was recommending then to the NHS the importance of capturing that learning. So I think it, it does come down to uh, the local organisations and, and how learning is, is valued um, and what the kind of easy mechanisms are to collect that and allow people to reflect on what's worked, but also importantly, what hasn't, because there's huge learning from failure as well. And I think there's going to be lots of things that we we see that haven't worked well during the last year as well. Silver. Thanks, Anna. Sorry, technology snafu. Um, yeah, so three things very quickly. One, completely agree with Susie. I think the pandemic's really shown the dividing line between organisations that have a codified way of this is how we learn from changes and events uh, and embed them and know which ones to discard, particularly those ones with a quality improvement approach uh, really built into their culture. The second thing is I think there is there is a risk that some places have learned the wrong lessons. So I think if you were looking, uh, if you're a national politician, one of the lessons you might learn is when it hits the fan, we can get the 230 leaders of secondary care providers on a, on a group phone call or conference call. It's harder to do that in primary care. It's harder to do that still in social care. So one of the lessons you could try and learn, which would probably be the wrong one, is do we have enough grip and control uh, in a crisis of the different parts of the healthcare system. And the third thing is, uh, I'm also worried that there's some learning that isn't being learned. Uh, my grammar's awful, I apologise. Um, and particularly around medical clinical training. So the number of clinicians who are still in training, who say, uh, it's just been assumed that I have to roll with the punches, that I won't be able to finish this placement. There's no real plan for how I'll make up time. And this is actually the time, the most concentrated time in my career, when I'm here to learn how to, the skills that will stand me in good stead for the next 40 to 50 years. And I think one of the lessons we should learn is that we can't just assume that time will be made up. There has to be an offer to the future clinicians and allied health professionals of the future of how we will support you throughout your career. Uh, I was just, I know we're quite tight on time, so I'm just going to add one quick thing to that. So I think really interesting reflections from Susie and Siva on broadly, if you like, system learning and local learning. I think there is obviously a major issue about government learning and thinking about its overall handling of the pandemic. There inevitably will be a public inquiry, but actually in terms of wanting to be ready for the next pandemic, you can't wait for a public inquiry to see all of its way through. So I think there is a really important need to understand what happened in the last 12 months so we're then making um 
clear decisions about what test and tracing capacity do we want what where do we want to think about our supply chains there's a whole set of quite big questions about our resilience to these kind of public health challenges that require national government to learn what we obviously in the system can do is right now be learning what have we learned about teaming what have we learned about clinical training what have we learned about digital innovation but i think we shouldn't forget there is that bigger question about learning thanks all and i think that was a, a great question to to wrap up our conversation today we knew that we would have way more that we wanted to cover than we could do in an hour and i think we might just carry on for another hour but unfortunately we are going to have to wrap up the uh, the online event um so can i just thank the fantastic panel for all of your contributions it's been such an interesting discussion but also thank everybody that's been watching and contributing your questions and and thoughts and reflections we've had so many that i really apologize we haven't been able to answer all of them but as i said if you do want to know more about the topics we've been talking about then please do take a look at our website where we've got lots of great resources uh, and there's some resources that we've highlighted on the event page which will be redirected to uh, when the live stream ends so do take a look at those too and there'll also be an option at the bottom of that page for you to give us some feedback uh, and we'll also send a link to that uh, in an email so if you do just have a little moment to fill that in please do because it really helps us to improve our, our next events and make them even better uh, and just finally to say that the recording of this event will be available on demand so please do share your link with your friends your colleagues your family anyone that you think might be uh, interested in in catching up and, and listening to the conversation today so thanks again and please do join us again for our next online event